Hello. Hey, Tim, this is Ben. How are you doing? Hey, very well, very well. Um, let's get started very simply. Um, maybe just could you, um, for the benefit of everyone listening, um, maybe just a brief overview of what the book actually is about. Okay. Well, this is Tim Hollis speaking from Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, the book that we're here to talk about today is the new one from uh, Arcadia called uh, Stuckies, Simply Stuckies. That's <laughs> the whole title. And people who live outside the South, that name might not mean as much to them, but uh, Stuckey's was a chain of, of candy and gift shops. And, of course, uh, if you were traveling on a long trip back in those days, you had to have somewhere to, to stop and buy the candy. You had to buy souvenirs, something to keep the kids quiet in the back seat. And one of the most important things that Stuckey's offered was clean restrooms. That was something anyone on a long trip had to have. So that's what Stuckey's was, and in this book we see how they developed from a single little pecan stand in Eastman, Georgia, to the uh, nationwide chain that it became by the early 70s. In trying to figure out the best way to do the Stuckey's story in the book, I, I pretty much stuck to a chronological way of doing it, but it starts with the in the early 30s when a fellow named W.S. Stuckey uh, first started selling pecans out of a roadside stand in Georgia, and it, it continues from there through the um, the early 70s, which I guess maybe about 1972 was probably Stuckey's peak because they had over 300 locations from coast to coast by that time. Uh, and then in 1973, we had the real or perceived energy crisis that resulted in, in a gas shortage, and people at that point stopped traveling like they used to. And um, it may not be as common as it used to be, but it's still there, and of course they, they do a big online presence now. Did you know it when you were when you were uh, growing up there? Oh yes, when when uh, of course my parents and I would take vacations as often as we could. My dad loved traveling. My mom absolutely hated it. So we sort of had to do a compromise. We couldn't take trips where we, where we were gone from home for a very long period of time. But when we would travel, yes, we did stop it uh, at. at every Stuckey's that we could find, I believe. Of course, I've gotten a lot of book mileage out of those vacations. I've used them in a lot of different books that I've done. So I was glad to finally be able to concentrate just on this one aspect of it. How did you come to kind of begin the process of writing this book? Well, it's sort of interesting. The, uh, the Stuckey's book is something of a milestone for me, I guess, because it's actually book number 30 for me. Yeah. And um, my my books cover a lot of different topics. A number of them have been about Southern tourism history, but I have also done books that deal with uh, with television history, old time radio. The only thing that really runs through all of my books is that they're all about pop culture nostalgia. The, the material, the postcards, and the photos are just so beautiful when reproduced in color like that. I always tell people that I actually, I, I've been a writer since I was seven years old, and that was many, many decades ago. Strangely enough, even when I was a kid, I was also writing nonfiction. I was actually uh, documenting some of these things that I've gone on to write books about later in life. I was actually researching that stuff when I was, when I was a kid. Well, how would you describe what makes the southeast and the region you kind of seem to focus on do you think it does indeed have its own particular feel well of course every part of the country has its own flavor and the southeast of course was was always famous for the hospitality for the uh, if you wanted to see palm trees and flamingos you went to florida if you wanted to see bears and hillbillies and and Indians who went to the Smoky Mountains. So not only did the Southeast have its own flavor, but each part of the Southeast had its own flavor. Of course, one thing that the Southeast had, and it wasn't anything to be proud of, but obviously everything was segregated back in those days. 
And that was one of the things that um, that Stuckies, especially today, they are they are especially proud to point out the fact that no matter where Stuckies was located all over the country, they never had segregated restrooms. The Stucky stores were usually built and located so far out in the middle of nowhere that they really weren't subject to any local ordinances or anything like that that would have caused them trouble. So um, I think that the, the company likes to point out that that really made them unusual in the South during that period. What's your process once you decide on a, on a topic to, to, ca- to kind of getting the thing from idea all the way to completion? The, the company archives have been split up and stored in many different places over the years, and so tracking down what I could was sort of difficult there. In fact, there are some parts of the company archives that even though the book is finished, I still never found them. But strangely enough, where a lot of the material came from are the people who are the passionate uh, Stuckey's collectors. They were pretty much able to fill in any gaps that I had in either my own collection or the stuff that I was able to get from the actual company archives. So really putting together a book of that kind is it's it's a lot like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. In the early 70s, right before right before the uh, the the energy crisis hit, Stuckey's had somewhere around 350 stores in 47 states. I think there were only three or three, maybe four states that did not have at least one Stuckey's. The state that had the most locations was Texas. And I guess that's because Texas had those long stretches of highway through nothing. You know, there there had to be somewhere for people to stop and stretch their legs and use the restroom. <laughs> there was a time when people, people from New York City would drive either U.S. Highway 1 down the Atlantic coast or maybe a little bit later, I-95. They would drive all the way from New York City to Miami, stopping at all the little roadside attractions and, uh, and the businesses like Stuckey's along the way. But eventually, they started getting on planes in New York and getting off in Orlando and never seeing anything in between. When it comes to tourism nostalgia or anything related to that, it's all part of that, that golden glow that people get just from remembering their childhoods. Uh, someone said one time that it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you grow up to be, what sort of profession you go into, that, that brief period of childhood always occupies a special place. But it's just it, 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 the, the whole tourism nostalgia is people remembering the things they did in their childhood, you know, when life was a lot simpler and it seemed a, a, a lot more appealing. And, of course, if you're a member of the baby boomer generation, everything was geared toward children at that time because they were the biggest section, biggest segment of the population. So I think, that's, I think that it's, it's simply people grabbing on to anything that's a fond memory from their childhood, and those family vacations, of course, are a part of it. What are the what are the kind of personal moments that inspired your love for for writing about pop culture? When I was nine years old, I was already nostalgic for my childhood. I would write letters to the TV networks, asking them whatever happened to these cartoons I used to watch when I was a kid. Pop culture, uh, I, it's it's just been a part of me. It's not something that I decided to write about. It's just something that I always did. I actually live in a pop culture museum of vintage toys and souvenirs and other memorabilia of that type. You know, I've done books that are uh, a lot longer, you know, big hardcover coffee table books, and some of them haven't sold half as well as some of the Arcadia books. And like I said, especially after this uh, Images of Modern America started, well, there are several books on the back burner, and then there are two, maybe three more that uh, are w- just waiting in line after that one. So uh, it looks like um, it looks like I'll be turning stuff out for them for quite some time to come. 
Well, thanks, Tim. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for chatting. Okay. It was very, very interesting. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing the book come out soon. Well, thank you. Have a good one. You too.